Hey, welcome back everyone to the final of Okay, so I now have 45 minutes to put everything together uh, and convince you that this all works because really I haven't been talking about homeo at all. Uh, and I want to build these things on homeo. So let's just jump into this. So now we finally come to the fine curve graphs. Mm. And I'm simply going to tell you the definition. So we're going to take S a surface of genus GE, at least two. And I'm going to build for you, for this is just for convenience, the fine non separating curve graph. And how is this thing supposed to work? This has vertices corresponding to essential, well, you don't need essential, non separating. Uh, simple closed curves, and it has edges corresponding to disjointness. So how does this differ from the normal non-separating curve graph? Well, it differs because I haven't set the word isotopy anywhere. So you sort of do the most naive thing in a way. So let's draw again the cartoon that everyone always draws. I'm going to try to draw a very similar cartoon to the one that I drew in the beginning. Uh, so I have a curve here, that's alpha, that gives me a vertex in my graph. Um, I have, I don't know, a curve beta here, that gives me a vertex in my graph. I have a curve gamma here. Let's start drawing in some edges. Alpha and gamma are disjoint, beta and gamma are non-disjoint. So far, so boring. Um, but now, to make things a little bit more interesting, what we can also do is we can look at, say, this curve. Let's call this curve delta. So two things happen now. In the normal curve graph, this would be the same vertex as gamma because they're isotopic. Now I'm spreading them apart. So this delta, because it's a different curve, will be its own vertex. And also, delta isn't disjoint from alpha anymore. This is a bygone. I could remove this by an isotopy, but I won't. So I'm going to say delta and alpha are not adjacent. Delta and gamma are adjacent. So right, we're in a conference for huge groups. This is a huge graph where the original curve graph was already locally infinite. This thing is locally uncountable, right? So. Uh, if you look at the link of a curve, it is all the curves in the complement, of which there are many. So this is unreasonably large. However, this is, a, this is good news, because we have an unreasonably large group acting on it. So we want an unreasonably large complex to try and capture something about. It. Okay, so the first thing we observe is that, of course, homeo and homeo zero do actually act on this fine non-separating curve graph. Um, right. So yes and no. So I'm not right, not with the graph topology of, of this, right? So if you imagine something close to the identity, it will send curves most likely to things that intersect themselves. And so it'll spontaneously move points two away. So for the graph topology, if, for the topology or CW structure coming from the graph structure, this is a terrible action. Um, but you're going to see later that sort of for the coarse geometry, there is a nice connection to, to, to the mathematics. Okay, so this thing is unreasonable. So uh, how do you ever prove something with it? Well, you prove that it's hyperbolic nevertheless, even though it's so big. So this is Jonathan Bowden and me and Richard Webb. And we prove that this graph is hyperbolic. And so the proof relies on a simple but useful lemma that tells us that we can actually use normal curve graphs to study this weird fine curve graph. And the idea is that these two curves, let's say delta and gamma, 
the isotopic on the surface, so the curve graph can see the difference between them. Um, but if I were to put an extra puncture here, then on this punctured surface, these two curves are suddenly not isotopic anymore. And similarly, the yellow and the green can be made disjoint on this surface. But if I were to puncture the surface here, then now on the punctured surface, um, the green and the yellow can't be made disjoint anymore. So this leads to this idea that I can probe curves by isotopy classes in a better and better way if I'm willing to puncture my surface at enough places. Right? So if isotopy classes rel more and more points, capture finer and finer informations about the curves themselves. So this next lemma makes this precise. So this is the approximation lemma. Uh, there are various ways to state this. I'm gonna state the one that I like best maybe. So suppose that I have P and S, a finite set. And suppose that I have two curves, alpha and beta in the complement of P and they're non-separating curves. What do I want to say? So the first thing is easy. Then if I look at the distance in the non-separating curve graph of the punctured surface of the isotopy classes of these two curves, so this is supposed to be isotopy class, then this is as most as big as the distance in the fine curve graph of the whole surface between the curves. This shouldn't surprise you. This is saying that controlling the actual curves is finer information than controlling the isotopy classes. So, so this, this is sort of, you can probably all prove this. Uh, I mean, you cannot prove the other thing as well. The weird thing about all of this is that none of the proofs are really hard. You just have to sort of stare at this and come up with the right ideas. The exciting thing about this is that if alpha and beta are transverse and in minimal position on the punctured surface, equality holds, right? So, so what am I saying here? I'm saying that look at, for simplicity, the green and the yellow. The green and the yellow aren't in minimal position on the surface. They have a bygone. So the curves don't, the, don't tell me about the isotopy classes. The isotopy classes are simpler than the curves make us believe. But if I puncture the surface here, now the curves are in minimal position on the punctured surface. I've sort of given every intersection an actual meaning up to isotope. And then what this is saying is that I can compute the distance between the actual curves in this fine curve graph using the isotopy classes in this normal curve graph of the punctured surface. Right? So this is just the normal non-separating curve graph, which has isotopy classes. And right? so let me remind you in case you weren't at or don't remember the recitations. So here, NC is the non-separating curve graph. Uh, whose vertices are isotopy classes. Okay, uh, so let's prove this lemma. Okay, so let's do the first. So what do we need to check? So take a path alpha one up to alpha n of non-separating curves in the fine curve graph of the surface. So what does this mean? So I want that I start with alpha and I end with beta. And the condition that I have is that consecutive ones don't intersect. Okay, now I want to say simply look at the isotopy classes of those and they will do what we want. Except that's not quite true because I want to go into the non-separating curve graph of S minus P. So there's a tiny subtlety here, which is that some of my curves that I've given, that I'm just given by the non by the fine non-separating curve graph, they may pass through some of these things. So if there exists an I such that 
alpha i intersect p is not empty, then what do we want to do? So then there's alpha i here, and it goes through one of my punctures. Well, the thing I want you to observe is that then, so let's say p in this intersection, then if I look at the next and the previous curve, they at least can't go through the same point, right? The predecessor and the, the successor need to be disjoint from alpha one, from alpha i, so they can't go through here. And this means that I can modify alpha i to go around this puncture instead, and the length of the path didn't change. So then replace uh, alpha i by alpha i bar by going p, right? And so the thing was, I before had alpha i minus one, alpha i, alpha i plus one, and so on, and these were joined. And now I have this new guy, alpha i bar, and I can instead go around, and this gives me a different path of things, which, um, which doesn't go through this. And so, oops, I do it. Yeah. So, maybe comment. Is the point of this to make sure that none of the alpha is good to be? Yes. Okay. So, using this, find a path of the same length mm. so that uh, alpha i intersect p is empty. And then we get that this is a path in the non-separating curve. Uh, yes, so let me be on the safe side. Um, let me shuffle around the prerequisites a little bit because I can already I can already sense someone was going to ask me about weird, uh, weirdly embedded things again. So this is this is fine. Um, do I need to tell you this now? I'm I'm going to I'm going to sweep this under the I think I'm going to sweep this under the rug. Yeah, let, let's leave it at that. Talk to me afterwards if you're really worried about weird curves. Okay, so this gives the this gives the first part. This gives the fact that if I have a path of some given length in the fine curve graph, I can improve it to a path that avoids a finite set, and so then I can um, then I can try and find. Uh, no, I think this is fine um, because I just need disjointness, and I'm allowed to replace my paths. I never replace. Uh, yeah, I think this is fine. Okay, so the second part of this is much more interesting, of course. The second part is we need to do essentially this, but we need to do it in reverse. So now I'm assuming uh, now I'm assuming that alpha and beta are transverse and in minimal position in s minus p. And now what do I get? Now I want to show equality. So now I need to start with a path of isotopy classes and extract good representatives. So now suppose we're given isotopy classes. Um, and let's maybe call the isotopy classes C for class. And these are classes of non-separating curves in the punctured surface so that Alpha defines the first class, beta defines the last class, and CI, CI plus one, have disjoint representatives. That's what we're given. And the thing we need to do is we need to find representatives that start with actual alpha and that start with actual beta and so that the consecutive ones are actually disjoint. If I didn't have this, this would be easy. I could just take some metric or something and take geodesic representatives 
and geodesic representatives always intersect minimally. But I need to also start and end at the specific points I want. So how do we do this? Well, here's what we're going to do. You're going to do the following. So pick any representatives alpha i such that the alpha i define the ci. Well, that's clearly not going to work. So let's start with a wish list of things. So that, uh, well, the first thing I want is I really want to start in alpha and I really want to end in beta. That's the thing I really need. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll lose. And the other thing is, let's assume that all other alpha i um, are, let's say, I don't know, I want to be safe. So let's make them smooth. And all alpha i, alpha j are transverse. And so why can I do this? The reason why I can do this is that if I have any curve in a little epsilon neighborhood, I can find a smooth representative. And if two curves are disjoined, then anything in a small enough epsilon neighborhood of the first will still be disjoined from the second. So this means that I can, uh, so, oh no, for this, I just don't even need this. I just make them all smooth. I just pick, pick any representative so that they're smooth and they're all transverse. And this I can just do by transverse solve. That, that, that here, I don't have to do anything. Okay. And now our goal will be to improve the alpha i such that any alpha i, alpha j, are in minimal position on S minus P. Oh, and I want these representatives, of course, also in S minus P. So we're trying to do something stronger a priori. Instead of just saying adjacent ones are supposed to be disjoint, what I'm going to say is I want to pick representatives so that any pair is now in minimal position on the punctured surface. So why is this a good idea? Because we know how two things can fail to be in minimal position. Well, if uh, alpha i and alpha j are not in minimal position, then there exists a bygone, right? That's the bygone criterion. So how does this look? Looks like this. Somewhere there's an arc of alpha i and there's an arc of alpha j. And together, they bound an embedded disk in my circle. So this here is this bygone B. This is an actual disk on the punctured surface. There's no puncture inside. So let's take an innermost such. What do I mean by innermost such bygone? What I mean is that, so i.e., no arc of any alpha k lies in B and joins a side to itself, right? So what I'm saying is there isn't a picture like this. There's no other curve that enters the bygone through the red and exits the bygone through the red again. There might be, right, because we have a bunch of curves, there might be lots of arcs which go across like this. Um, there might be other alpha k which cross the bygone, but I want that everything that interacts with this bygone goes straight across. And now what do we do? So now observe, we're assuming that alpha and beta are in minimal position. So this means that this this red and this green curve, they're not the pair alpha and beta. In other words, at least one of them is not alpha and not beta. Let's say in my case, alpha i is neither alpha nor beta, right? Because these two are in minimal position. That's the assumption of the, of the approximation. And now you can maybe see what we do. Now what we do is 
we modify this one. So now I can go across like this instead and find a new representative for alpha i. And because we dragged it along a bygone, it still is the same isotopy class. And because there were no internal bygones here, the total number of intersections in this collection has gone down. So then define alpha i bar, say, by dragging alpha i along the bygone. So this is now alpha i bar. And then we get that, of course, the isotopy class of this hasn't changed. And the total number of intersections between, uh, oh, yeah, let me say this. Uh, replacing alpha i by alpha i bar decreases um, the total number of intersections between all of these curves. That's you rule up. That's exactly why I want transversality. Um, so I have compact things, and the intersection of any two is supposed to be. I mean, you can also worry about what it means to transversely intersect for for continuous curves, by which I mean there's a little neighborhood in which the intersection looks like a cross. Yeah. Can you just use the idea you know, from the beginning that you realize the mass of physics and you get the wrong starting and ending points, but they are still in the minimal position. And the minimal position of the pair of curves should be unique after the homeomorphism. So then just you can use the homeomorphism and go move the entire system so that the endpoints are in the right position. Talk about this afterwards. This might work that I, this might work that the, yeah, let's talk about this afterwards. I like this idea, but, but yeah. Okay, good. So now we have the approximation lemma. Um, it tells us how to compute distances between points. Okay, good. Uh, just are we allowing, uh, I just missed, are we allowing curves that are isotopically trivial? No, non-separating curves are never isotopically trivial. Oh, okay. But that's a good comment. Okay. Uh, we can't allow, we can't allow, um, uh, yeah, no, well, yes and no. So, okay, let me make this comment now. I wanted to not say this, but, but now I have to. Uh, but it's good, it's good. So what happens if I drop N? Well, in the recitations, we've seen that the non-separating curve graph for a closed surface is the same as the normal curve graph. But I've also said that for a punctured surface, the non-separating curve graph is wildly different. So that's the real reason I need to do this here. Um, so the problem is that this kind of approximation, you need to use paths on the isotopy side where every isotopy class still defines an essential curve after filling in the punctures. Because otherwise you'll run through, otherwise the distance here will collapse to something that's way too small. So you could do this not with non-separating curves, but with so-called surviving curves. And then you could use the full C here, um, but, but yeah. Okay, now what? Um, now what? Well, now I need to hit you with a few theorems. Uh, and you might expect which theorem I want to use. So the version I'm gonna use is due to Alex Rasmussen. And it says that these guys are hyperbolic. Okay, so I won't prove this. Uh, I won't prove this, but I'll tell you how you would. So actually, the proof of this is again, this bicorn surgery, but you have to be very careful. So why do you have to be very careful? You have to be very careful because now not all, there's even fewer bicorns allowed. You now have two non-separating curves and you need to only ever use curves where the surgery I get from taking one arc from one and connect along one arc of the other. You only want to take those where the result is non-separate. And it's easy to cook up examples where not all of them are like this, right? So the geometry of this is wildly different. So you have to be very careful. But the basic structure of the proof is exactly the same. 
you guess paths there, or you guess these connecting graphs, they're these spike horns, you show they have thin triangles, and then you get hyperbolicity. And now we come to something very curious. Um, on the one hand, this should make us very happy because we say, well, distances in the graph I want to understand are completely coded by distances in another graph, and this guy here is hyperbolic. So one way to think about this approximation lemma, lemma in sort of fancy language is to say, well, this fine curve graph seems to be some kind of inverse limit of all the punctured non-separating curve graphs where I'm allowed to puncture everywhere. You can make this sort of precise. You can say that you have the, all the finite subsets of your surface ordered by inclusion. You have forgetful maps going the other way between the non-separating curve graphs of the, the punctured surfaces where I fill in punctures. I can always do this because I'm in the non-separating setting. I have an inclusion of the fine curve graph into this limiting object. And this lemma exactly tells me that the distances in the fine curve graphs are the sort of limit distance in this thing. So I'm taking a limit of hyperbolic spaces. So maybe I have a chance of showing that the limit is hyperbolic. But that's not quite right, right? Because if I take a limit of hyperbolic spaces, maybe the hyperbolicity constant gets worse and worse and worse. And then I have nothing to say. And that's the cool thing. Because if you looked at our proof of hyperbolicity of the curve graphs, we've shown that bicorn paths are one, have one thin triangles, always one, no matter what the surface is. And you have the same feature here. So actually, the real theorem by Rasmussen is not this, but this, that delta is independent of S and P. So this is what's called uniform hyperbolicity of the curve graphs. And uh, yeah, so this wasn't proved for this. This was something curve graph people liked anyway. Uh, and we proved this for curve graphs just because we thought this was a cute question. Now it's crucial for this for this whole thing. Okay, so now we're in really good shape because now we have a limit of delta hyperbolic spaces where the delta doesn't blow up. And so we should expect the limit to still be delta hyperbolic. And that actually works. So let's do this now. So now let's prove of the hyperbolicity. Uh, again, there's various ways to prove this. The maybe slickest one is to phrase hyperbolicity as a four-point condition and then directly just use this. I'm going to do something slightly different, which I think is easier to sort of see, uh, but it's the same idea. Um, so take, and I said as a life lesson to never prove hyperbolicity by taking a geodesic triangle, and I'm going to be a rebel and break my own rules and going to prove hyperbolicity by taking a geodesic triangle. So take a geodesic triangle in this fine curve graph. So how does that look? Maybe I need more space than this. So this is just some collection of curves form a triangle. So paths of curves that form a triangle, consecutive ones are this. So I'm going to draw that uh, optimistically as if it were a hyperbolic triangle like this. So this is my triangle. So this is the geodesic triangle. I have until half past, right? Quarter past. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll still do it. Uh, this is not hard. So, okay, now we're gonna do various, now we're gonna do various modifications. So this has a bunch of curves on it, right? So these are really curves. And as we've said a bunch of times, these curves can be terrible. They can be these space-filling curves everyone keeps bothering me about. Well, they can't be space-filling because they're simple, uh, but, but they can be sort of terrible curves. But now the first thing is I will replace every curve by one that is smooth and also so that, um, also so that everything in this other triangle is, um, uh, it's transverse to each other. So replace by a quasi-geodesic triangle, which is two Hausdorff close, 
let's call the triangle delta to delta. And now all curves are smooth and transverse. Why can I do this? So this is the same thing I said before. Any curve on a surface, any simple curve on a surface is colored. And this means that I can always replace a curve by any epsilon modification inside a little tube. And making a little epsilon modification inside a tube is a distance two step in the fine curve graph, right? I can jump from the core of my annulus to the boundary. That's the one distance step. And I can jump from the boundary back into this on the other curve. And that's a one distance step. So the key here is that for epsilon small, replacing alpha by alpha prime contained in an epsilon neighborhood of alpha um, is a distance two. Right, and so now first by moving everything distance two, I can make uh, I can make them smooth, but I can also at the same time make them uh, make them transverse to each other because smooth curves I can always wiggle a bit so that they're that they're transverse. Okay, so now I have this green triangle, which uh, is close to the old triangle, and now I'm going to pick an enormous puncture set. So this enormous puncture set is chosen so that any two curves on the green triangle are in minimal position with respect to this puncture set. So choose P enormous, big enough, such that uh, any two curves in the modified triangle are in minimal position on S minus P. Right, so these are now transversely intersecting smooth curves. So their union is something that looks like a graph on the surface. Simply put a puncture into every complementary component. And then you won't have bygones anywhere. And then, then you have this property. But what does this tell me? This tells me, why, and also why is this so colorful? This tells me now that with the approximation lemma, this thing is isometric to its image in the non-separating, right? The distance between the endpoints is exactly the same in the fine curve graph and in the, uh, the approximation. And it's approximately the distance between these two points because I started with a quasi-geodesic triangle and the same is true for any, any other point. But now we win because this guy is delta thin. And this means that anything on one of the sides is fairly close to something on one of the other two, but they're in minimal position. And so this distance in uh, this approximation is the same as the distance in the fine curve. Right. So let's put this here. Since this is delta thin in this, the same is true. Right, so that's how you show hyperbolicity of the fine curve graph. You just approximate it by more and more punctured curve graphs. So now we've done sort of the first half of the program that we needed. I have a hyperbolic space on which homeo zero acts. And what, what else did I need to get quasimorphisms? The other thing I needed to get quasimorphisms was lots of interesting maps. So here, I need to speed up a bit and just tell you a few theorems, but I think you'll be sort of able to believe me when, when I say what comes next. Where do the maps come from? These are these kind of maps that we talked about for a bit in the recitation. So recall that there are point pushing maps. I'm gonna phrase this a bit more, more fancy now, uh, so there's something called the Berman exact sequence. And the Berman exact sequence says that if I look at the mapping class group of a surface punctured at a point, then I can fill this in and map any mapping class of the punctured surface to a mapping class of the closed surface. I just forget 
that I had to fix the point. And that's clearly surjective. And the content of the Berman exact sequence is that the kernel is exactly uh, the fundamental group of the surface. And this is exactly this push map we talked about in the recitation. So you take a loop based at P, you push it around, you get a mapping class here. It clearly is isotopic to the identity. So the fact that this is zero is clear. The content of this theorem really is that this just depends on the loop as a, as a homotopy class and that it's the full kernel. Um, and why do we care about this? We care about this because there's a theorem by Kra. And Kra's theorem tells me that if I start with a really complicated loop, this mapping class will be really complicated. So if gamma in this fundamental group is filling, so it intersects every simple, every essential simple closed curve up to homotopy, then the push along gamma is something called uh, pseudo Anosov. And if you don't know what pseudo Anosov is, pseudo Anosov means that there exists a flat structure on S minus P such that push acts as a hyperbolic matrix. So acts as an affine map with irrational eigendirections. So I'm not gonna very precisely say what I mean by that. So I'm putting it in quotes, uh, but this should remind you of what we did in the first recitation that we had the square tile thing. So you can't always get it to be square tiled, but you can always get it to be, uh, you can always get it to be a singular flat structure so that the eigendirections start filling up everything. And the reason I bring this up is that then you should maybe believe uh, what Mazaminsky tell us, and this is that all pseudo Anosovs act as loxodromics on the normal curve graph, uh, which we've seen for this one example, but, but maybe you'll believe that this is, this is true in general. And this is now really good for us. Because this tells me that if I take a representative of a point pushing pseudo Anosov, then it will act on the punctured curve graph. Forget even about non separating, it will just act on the punctured curve graph as a loxodromic, making fast progress. So, certainly, it will make fast progress on the non separating curve. But then it has to make, then the representative has to make really fast progress on the uh, fine curve graph. So this means that any representative of a relative pseudo Anosov will act as a loxodromic on the fine curve graph. Yes, I can finish in one minute. So this implies that any representative of the push along gamma acts on this guy loxodromically. So now we need one thing. Now I need, this wasn't quite everything. If you remember the Bestina Fujiwara theorem, we've almost done it. Bestina Fujiwara told us if I have a group acting on a hyperbolic space, check, with loxodromic elements, check, we have lots of them. And I find at least two which are independent in a sense that I haven't quite explained to you, then I get an unbounded quasimorphism. Well, since I didn't quite explain the, uh, what the independence even means, uh, I'm now just going to say, because we have absolute freedom in how to choose this curve, as long as it's filling, it's easy to cook up to completely different pseudo -anosis. Um Talk to me afterwards if you want to see a quick reason for why this is true. So by choosing um, gamma one and gamma two, very different can get independent loxodromics in the sense of Bestina Fujiwara, 
and then you get a quasimorphism, and then you win. And now I'm done. Thank you. So maybe it's time for one quick question, and then there's a coffee break, so you can ask. Any questions you would want? No questions. Okay. Speaker again.